All right, episode number 125 of the Profit Engine Show. Today we have Stefan Spencer on, good friend, good colleague of a um, lot of people who are in the industry. Uh, he's worked on Tony Robbins stuff. He's worked on Jay Abraham stuff. Uh, he's very well known across this, uh, the industry as one of the top gurus, three books out. Uh, it was the first book I ever bought uh, back in 2010 when I started my agency was the uh, it was his SEO book. So I think this is the quintessential sort of cap on the last of the three episodes of uh, our SEO journey here. So we have a really long but very fruitful discussion. Lots of nuggets in here, lots of gold from Stefan. So enjoy this conversation. If you are an SEO person and you want to learn more, this is the episode to pay attention to. All right, Stefan, how are you? I'm glad to have you on my podcast. I've been looking forward to this forever. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's fabulous. <laughs> well, I appreciate you um, sort of jumping in in a not in last minute fashion, but boy, we, we had a good conversation. And, and this industry, this SEO industry, and that's this is one of the three part series that we're doing on SEO for um, the Profit Engines podcast. And I love to talk about history of SEO because you started back. I still have the book when you know with Rand and you and you know the whole thing when it really sort of started like 2000. I mean back in really the earliest, almost like I almost feel like the 2000s, the era of the 2000 2010 is like ancient history for SEO. Uh -huh. um, so let's talk about you've got the history from the beginning really, and and I understand and you understand where the market's going. I want to talk about really what we do every day, like what you and I do every day, which is we kind of deal with the customer's education process about what is happening in the SEO world, right? We have to sort of understand, dumb it down to a level where people go, hey, I get it. But really, content, right? If you think about this, there's content, there's technical, and there's links. But in reality, we've won on content being sort of like the silver bullet now, which is that if you've got a Wikipedia that Google likes, and you know, obviously there's other things involved, but I tend to see that that's, ha what, what's your opinion on this? Because we try and commit customers to doing content, really good content, and saying like, you're, you know, what you're gonna find is not just human beings out there besides Google, obviously. Uh, but what we're finding is that if we really write to a point where we become the, the authority in the market for the topic, um, Google falls in love with us. I mean, it's, it's just the weirdest thing. It's all of a sudden, like, it's not just rankings. It's like tens of thousands of keywords get popped up underneath these huge pillar articles that we've written. And, and Google says, well, you must be the guy. So what do you think mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, well, I think uh, a trap that folks get stuck in is they're writing solely for their customer base. And that's not necessarily an influencer as Google sees it. So if we're writing for our customers and they don't really have powerful websites with high authority, high trust scores, then we're missing the mark. We need to create remarkable content that's worthy of remark and target the, the linkerati when we're writing at least some of these content pieces. Because the stuff you're writing for your customer base may not land for the linkerati and it may not be worthy of the, their time and attention and for them to, to blog about you. So how are you going to get the powerful links unless you're catering to the audience that has a powerful website? Yeah, for, for sure. And I think the big misnomer in, I think, the SEO world is that, yes, there are certainly things that are complex. But reality is, is that this is all really, it's doable. The question is, it's expensive now. I mean, I have to admit, I, I've seen this industry grow from the, like you go back even further than I can, you know, you, you've started way back. And, yeah, 1995. <laughs> right. And, and, but to, to, to even really what we're talking about now is that the price to pay to have Google as your date to the dance. That's what we love to say. Like, we're like, oh, you bring Google's hand to the dance today? Okay. <laughs> hey, you want to do that? She's very expensive to take out to dinner. Um, you really have to think like, look, this is like a monster strategy um, of not 
thinking through, as you said, not just like writing for the audience, writing, but becoming an authority, getting so you can get the authority backlinks because people want to link to you because you're the resource. But it's also the technical aspects of dealing with the algorithm shifts every single day. Google's throwing a curveball and a slider and a, and a knuckleball. You have to actually think like this isn't static. There, there used to be like these seemingly programmatic stuff that we, you know, we, we make up a new name, penguin, zebra, whatever, mosquito, make up a new name for these algorithm shifts. But now it seems with AI, and maybe you can clarify this if you have some thoughts on how this is, it almost feels as if, and I see this because of our team really is in, engaged every day with you know a lot of accounts doing SEO, that there is some sort of like pathway now where the shifting is based off of sort of how they say this about Google, but maybe even profitability. I don't know. It seems like there's something else that's in the mix where we could fix things and it seems fine. And then the next day it's all changed again because it's like, oh, well, another thing ran through, whether you want to call it a, a one of these animals. I don't think that those things even exist. I think it's more like the algorithm is so complex now that it's it's AI learning has now shifted its its brain its rank brain into like saying okay look like, let's let's just go down this path and then we'll find stuff and then we'll just sort of auto correct. I, I'd love to hear your opinion on what you think how these changes are being ins like insulated from the public but really being driven by Google's internals. As I'm I think as anybody else I'm stymied every day when I see stuff move around. Yeah, so, yeah, so certainly this is a. Uh, a shifting sands when we have to be comfortable with change. And if we're not comfortable with change, we're in the wrong industry. <laughs> so, um, and we need to be always thinking three steps ahead, more like 10 steps ahead. It's really all about AI. You know, the machine learning is, is in place in a lot of the uh, algorithms at Google. But machine learning isn't full-blown AI. We're going to see full-blown AI, right? Autonomous intelligence, not just artificial, right? And what that means is that we're going to need to not rely on tricks or uh, hacks or things like that. We need to think more strategically. And uh, signals that we're used to having be important may no longer be important over time. And things that we are not used to being signals or treated as signals by Google may very well become signals. Uh, Matt Cutts at one point said, you know, we would use in the algorithm uh, whether the webmaster had a cat as a signal if it meant the results would be more uh, relevant and higher quality. We'll use anything, in other words, right? So if uh, the machine learning algorithms are, they have a large enough training data set, then they can get very good, better than humans at detecting spam, at just doing a sniff test on the quality of your content, on how authoritative, trustworthy, and uh, expert you are in your topic space. You know, EAT uh, stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. It's mentioned a number of times in the Google Quality Rater guidelines. And uh, the, this army of human reviewers that are going through websites, uh, you know, evaluating them on all these various criteria, including EAT, it not for, it's not for the purpose of uh, demoting your website. It's for the purpose of giving a huge training data set to an AI. And what I like to say about, you know, how do you outsmart an AI? Like, actually, let me pose that as a question. How do you <laughs> outsmart an AI? Yeah. Because that's I, what I, we're, we're facing. You know, we're, we, we, I'll tell you, the only answer that I can think of for how to outsmart an AI is with another AI. We need to become uh, expert users of AI in order to compete in this new world order of SEO. And some people like to be contentious and say, well, SEO is dead. Well, SEO as we know it may be dead, where it's just the old school type of SEO. Folks who are not using machine learning based um, tools for now, and then things that will get uh, more advanced and you know, deep 
learning type of tools in the future. And I'm not saying you have to become an expert on AI. You just need to start using the tools. And, and there are tools out there that already incorporate some level of AI, like, for example, MarketMuse. You know, so you, you, you should just start using these tools. Uh, Google Cloud Natural Language uh, API. That's, uh, that's an AI-based tool that can evaluate your content for uh, what, how many topics you have and the salience score for each topic and a whole bunch of things. And you can run a free demo uh, on uh, your content. Just copy and paste your homepage content into the demo box, hit the, the, the go button, and, and see how, how Google scores you on salience for all the different topics it discovers. So there's lots of tools out there that will help you with uh, SEO from an AI or machine learning based perspective, and there's gonna be a lot more. And so we need to stay ahead of the game. Yeah, and so the, the one missing ingredient that we find uh, from time to time or, or more often than not, and this is the quintessential um, dialogue that we have initially with customers is that a lot of the websites today or even built whatever yesterday built on a year ago two years ago it's almost as if every single time we start we've got to start with a technical pristine super fast untouchably perfect website to start with because Google says hmm I'm going to find this information looks like you have a good set of information but I want it just the way I want it and we found that if we can put that technical audit in front of the whole thing that we get a much better result and a lot of people can't come to grips with this beautiful website they've just built or they built a while ago and we have to say mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. gotta start from scratch man it's just it you have to build it perfectly if you want to rank really well and, and that's what that's what we found i'm sure you probably have some different opinions on that but we literally start from scratch because we know what it wants to eat every day and if we can feed it properly the ai along with the content perfect site perfect all a pluses across the board we really have a better chance at ranking well i do agree that the technical side of it is the foundation if you build a house on a on a a weak foundation, you're going to have trouble. Th that said, I normally work with businesses that have uh, a lot of history with their website and they're not going to toss mm -hmm. it out and start all over again. I mean, I've worked with Chanel, Zappos, Sony, CNBC, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, Best Buy Canada. You know, and these are companies that are not going to uh, like start fresh with a new website. Like the, it's a multi-year, multi-million dollar project to, to do a, a replatforming or a, a major redesign. So yeah, we, we work with what we have. A lot of times the page speed core scores are really poor. They'll be in the red zone, uh, especially on mobile. And uh, they'll have lots of issues with the uh, technical misconfigurations. They'll be overly reliant on disallows in the robots.txt instead of using no index and then they uh, I discover tons of pages that shouldn't be in the search results that that are because they haven't been no indexed and lots of you know issues that need to be cleaned up it's a it's a major initiative but we, we can't start from scratch with pristine website I, I very rarely do I have a client that has a, a brand new website you know like the reason yeah. why I brought it up is that, you know, we deal with a lot of SMB, you know, so and a lot of SMB, their investments in these sites are usually at best lackluster, at best lackluster. And we're really talking about, you know, they start with, you know, some template that they have either purchased from a, you know, template center or a template from a, a, an agency. And I, I literally say, look, you know, the point of doing this is to make this site you know the authority and you can't build it on you know sequenced templates that are being pumped out by some theme forest it just it can't it just does not work you really have to cognitively think about clean crisp 
content technical superior to the competitors. And I think people don't realize that they're when they're marching down the path trying to get thousands of people to come to their site, you've got competitors that are way, way down the path. And you've got to think like, hey, how do I bulletproof this thing for tomorrow? And for the next, so how can we make it flexible in the architecture set up so that we can move things when Google moves things? Because that's another thing you have to consider is to be flexible with some of the activity. So you're building your, your house so it can withstand a hurricane, right? Mm -hmm. Which might be the next algorithm shift. So I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Well, um, SMBs oftentimes rely on uh, WordPress as their uh, their CMS, and uh, then they'll install a bunch of plugins that sound good, and it's like they're in a candy store, and like I'll take that one and that one and that one and that one, or they'll rely on a web developer, or web designer to give them advice and they won't understand the SEO implications of what they're doing. And then you end up with 20 or 30 different plugins installed. The website becomes super slow. They uh, start with legacy old uh, uh, templates, you know, WordPress themes and so forth, and then build on that. And they end up with really huge CSS files. It, it becomes uh, just a, a real mess. And then you do have to kind of start from scratch with a brand new theme and so forth. Um, now, if it's an e-commerce site, it seems like Shopify is the uh, the, the choice for, for many new e-commerce sites. And that's an okay solution, but from an SEO pers uh, perspective, it's uh, not super flexible in terms of what you can do with it from an SEO perspective. You're better off with a uh, like a e-commerce platform such as Magento that allows you to uh, use uh, a lot more plugins and to go into uh, the uh, back end and, and do a lot more stuff. But yeah, it's 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 a uh, it's an investment of uh, time and money for, uh, for for a client to to take that leap with you and say, well, you know, this wasn't built right, and we have to uh, do some major invasive surgery. In fact, that was why um, I invented a, a, a an SEO platform for optimizing websites using proxy server uh, re using reverse proxy technology back in 2003. It's called Gravity Stream and uh, in fact, that was a big reason why I was able to sell my agency uh, back in 2010, because that that technology, which was um, we charged on a on a pay for performance basis, so a cost per click, like 15 cents a click, and so we had clients who were paying us seven figures a year uh, right. for that technology, uh, and if they turned it off, then they had to go in and do the major invasive surgery to their uh, website to their e-commerce platform and for many of these clients it was a multi-year multi-million dollar investment so they kept using gravity stream uh, so that ended up being the majority revenue of our agency was this uh, uh, gravity stream technology which I wouldn't have seen back in you know when I started I uh, this this kind of was an opportunity that presented itself because there is so much involved in doing a, a major overhaul from a technical standpoint, especially with these larger websites. It's a, it's a big, costly, uh, painful investment to uh, to overhaul for SEO a website. It's kind of like I, I, I like giving this analogy when talking to prospects that whoever developed your website didn't really understand SEO that well. And so what you ended up with was a house where they forgot or didn't think to wire it with electrical. And so Perfect. you turn on the light switch and nothing turns on. And that's because there's no wiring and you have to tear out the drywall to add the wiring and then patch up the drywall. It's so much more expensive than building the house from the get-go with the wiring built in, with, with that in mind. So that's yeah. what ends up happening. And then the client understands that, oh, okay, that makes sense. And yeah, that's what happened. And Well, it's interesting because he, here's the nuts and bolts. If you do it right, 
like we've done for lots of customers and for ourselves, there's an unending amount of stream of traffic and leads. You don't have to pay for it. And that people don't realize they're investing in literally, it's like investing in the stock market. I mean, it, the returns just keep coming if you've done it right because you become that stable authority that you're not, unless you do something crazy stupid, you know, you can continue to reap the rewards of having a continued traffic stream. And people don't realize that long-term investment that's coming from that initial sort of push of inertia that really changes their, I mean, we've had customers go and change their whole lives because they're, and change our lives. I mean, we've become a seven figure company because we own all these SEO terms for all these medical, um, you know, marketing terms. So we, we just basically every day, there's someone knocking on the door, they found us. But I have a question for you that's probably more relative to the audience that's that's here. So we talked about sort of the authority being built by content, really important to, to do content. We've talked about the technical analysis and that really you should be mm -hmm. thinking through process of um, yeah. building. You know, more. I, I want to add that the authority, I think, is really built more by the links than by the content. The content is a necessary yeah. prerequisite. Yeah. But so now he's just about to go into, you, you stole my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Content, now we're talking, you know, we talked about the technologies. Now we're talking, let's get to the meat, which is what everybody wants to know, right? Link building. So good, bad, and different, black hat, green hat, purple hat, you pick a hat. Um, there's so much to, to talk about with link building. We could probably go on for a day about, you know, different types of links and how do you get them and, you know, so you buy them, you don't buy them, you you, you acquire them or, or you, you acquiesce them, however you want to say, or you you beg, borrow, and steal, and you you trade, you link. There's so many different ways to consider that. And all of our clients say, well, you know, look, we have to literally have $2,000 a month in minimum in link building spend for any client. Because they're like, look, you have to build links to build your authority, period. End of story. There's no way around it. You, you have to do it. And obviously, we're, we're doing outreach and we're contacting other blog owners and saying, hey, you know, we've got a great piece of content. And we do all the link, you know, uh, dialogue talk about this because this is the holy grail at least it was a long time ago to be kind of like considered like it was it was that and then obviously after you know 2016 i think everything changed but now we're talking like a different game which is it's really about like this whole kind of like it's authority plus you know putting and it doesn't necessarily need to be even on topic it needs to be on point and maybe you could talk a little bit about that about the link building because that's the the third part of this discussion I wanted to get to, because I know you and I, we have a, you know, we have a short window here to talk about this, but this is the thing I wanted to hear what your thoughts were, because a lot of our clients ask us, well, why is SEO so expensive? You guys just do content, I get it. You do technical fixes, but then you have to spend all this thousands of dollars to do what? Like, I don't get, what is a link? Why do I have to buy this stuff? It's not buying, it's building your, literally your infrastructure of your house. It's like building all of the conduits. Like, okay, great, you built the house, now let's pipe in the electrical, right? As you said before, now we have to put a nice 200 watt amp system in here, a 200 amp system. Right? So yeah. take that one <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. Yes. So I, uh, I always like to offer a pay for performance option whenever possible. So with, a, uh, with link building, if the client has a minimum of let's say $5,000 uh, budget per month, so that goes in as a retainer, but it's on a pay for performance basis. So when they work with my team on link building and we're using tools like, like Pitchbox for outreach and so forth. And what we do is we charge for the links that are acquired. Now we're not buying the links, we're not uh, paying webmasters or bloggers off because then that I think leads to lower quality links and it also leaves a footprint that is not good. Uh, so it's very important to stay pearly white hat in, in this and, and not take any shortcuts. But the idea here is if the client does not get the links that, that um, you're working on, on, on acquiring, then they shouldn't have to pay. They should get a refund of that, let's say 5,000 or whatever the amount is uh, of, of that retainer. So what we do is we, they have to pay in advance for the, the retainer uh, before we start work on that month's link building. 
then we send them a statement at the end of the month, well, shortly after the end of the month, after we have acquired all the links and we have a statement with reconciliation of, all right, these are all the prices that um, these links cost you, that we're, we're uh, charging you like on a sliding scale based on the authority of the website that's linking and estimated uh, click-through traffic and you know various other um, factors. And so they just look at the final bill and say, all right, so you, you uh, went a little bit over, you know, 5% over, 10% over. So that goes on to the next month's invoice. Okay, no problem. Or you came a little bit short, you know, 10% under. And so that's a credit on next month's uh, bill. Great. So they can go and pull up each of those uh, web pages that we listed that's uh, linking to the, to the client's website and confirm that, yep, those are legit links and I can put in the website of the, uh, the, the linking party into Majestic or link research tools, Ahrefs, whatever the favorite tool that they use and confirm that, wow, these, these, are, these are good links. These are good DR scores, good domain authorities or good um, LRT power trust scores or whatever. Yeah, and I think that's the best way. We've actually done that now, too. We stopped sort of doing retainer plus, you know, X. We just said, look, we are going to go out and acquire, and we have some minimum thresholds, and that's it. I mean, there really isn't – it's almost at a certain point now in the market where it, it's become easier to do SEO because it's very transparent. It's like there's three parts, content, technical, links, done. I mean, there's other things out there, obviously, we could talk about, but I think if you took the major pile of things that need to be done and sort of synthesize it, that's kind of it. I mean, yeah. obviously, there's all this other stuff. Now, here's the last thing I want to talk about, and maybe, again, we've got like two more minutes here. I, I want <clears throat> We have seen, and this is the, my suspicion, and you could probably confirm this or not confirm this. I will tell you that it seems like the better the SEO, the better – the AdWords and the better the social media because I think brand is becoming more powerful in the market because brand seems to be taking like Google seems to be wanting brand and maybe that's why like we're finding that people are like I don't know why but geez your guys cost per lead and social and AdWords is better you know since we started to do the SEO and I'm like well I think what's happening is that Google's recognizing your brand and then your customers are seeing the brand more so that there's sort of like this kind of, I don't know if you want to say like combination or coincidence, but it seems like that's happening. A virtuous and, cycle. Yeah, maybe that's, that's a crazy name for it. Virtuous cycle of traffic. You know? <laughs> so what do you think? Uh, this is sort of the wrap up question. And, and I just wanted to bring this out there because we've been, it's funny. We've had this discussion twice in a row. Uh, yesterday and the day before where someone said, well, I don't understand why your cost per lead in, in these two other paid channels is so much better. And I'm like, well, we happen to be delivering thousands of hits of traffic through SEO that are on top of that. So maybe there could be correlation. I mean, you could argue either way, but I don't know. I'd love to hear what you think about it. Yeah, I think there's a pretty good separation of church and state in terms of the Google algorithm uh, using, uh, let's say, Ad, AdWord or Google Ads data to like quality score, for example, is on the ad side of things, right? So we want to, uh, if we're Google, we want to keep that quite separate from the organic, the editorial side of things where the organic results are. But I think there is a correlation. There is a bleed over. If you do really well with SEO, then you're going to just be uh, conveying to the to the searcher, to the journalist, to the potential business partner, whoever it is that you're legit, because they're going to Google you. They're going to do their due diligence. They're going to look for reviews and for uh, scams and scam reports and things like that. And if you have the deck stacked in your favor because you've done SEO so well, there's going to be no question in their mind that you're legit. You've got credibility. So um, I think that, that that certainly goes into the quality score algorithm. If somebody is uh, uh, clicking on your ad and staying, um, you've got 
brand recognition, you've got legitimacy, and they're not questioning whether this is a fly-by-night operation. And so hitting the back button and going to another ad, that definitely sends a signal to, to Google Ads uh, quality score algorithm that you're legit. Yeah, because there was always a thought that Google might be counting conversions and conversion architecture around the browser, and they're sniffing the sort of conversion aspects of the site to see whether it's not. I mean, you could probably argue that different ways, but I think at the end of the day, it's sort of just a human factor at the end of the day that they, they probably just happen to find you more often and your brand is just more relevant to the, to the person. And yeah, so... Google has uh, said many times that they do not use your Google Analytics data against you. Time on site, uh, bounce rate, all that sort of stuff, conversion rate, they do not use against you in either the ad algorithm, the quality score algorithm, or in the organic side. And I believe them because if, if, if there was any hint that that was going on, people would leave Google Analytics in droves, but that is the go-to platform for analytics, way more right. than Adobe Analytics or anything else out there. Everybody's on Google Analytics, even the huge companies. Yep, well, that's why I said, I think it's really just a coincidence or you know, this overwhelmingly brand-centric market we're kind of entering, and I think that's the kind of echelon of where people need to think about their marketing in general is building their brand equity yeah. in the market and then now you've become a player in Google's mind as an authority and you've got good as we said tactical assets you've got good link building all really works and that investment boy does it pay off it's built yeah. a seven year company for me it built your company and we've got to yeah. tell people so like, your company hey, sure SEO is not that it's just different it's just you yeah. know it's it's basic maybe it's back to basics so um, well don't I don't know if it's basic but I think it's fundamental that you have to build a brand you know, yeah. So it's it's not a foregone conclusion for everybody. You have to kind of bring them along for like to show them the bigger vision of what they could be. If they're just if they have a URL instead of a brand, they basically it's planned obsolescence, right? So I've I've actually rebranded clients' uh, companies, like a 40-year-old company, Alpha and Omega Financial Services. Uh, yeah, 40 years old. And uh, because of me, they rebranded to livingwealth.com because their previous URL was AOFSUSA.com. You yeah. can't even like say that. I guess. <laughs> it's painful. And then uh, I had another client. Uh, they, they had a convoluted name and, uh, and, and URL, ARI2000.com, uh, American Response Inc. So they became Skycover, which is a... Uh, do-it-yourself, uh, install your own security system, skycover.com. So I found these domains after market, you know, so they were uh, not available to register. We had to negotiate, and sometimes you're going to have to spend many thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars to acquire a really cool domain. remember when uh, my co-author, uh, Rand Fishkin, was uh, talking to me about acquiring Moz.com and how much money he was going to spend on that. I'm like, whoa, that is some serious money. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a good investment. So Moz.com, nobody even recalls it's so old now that uh, they used to be SEOmoz.org, you know. The the brand is every, it's, it's everything. It's like the, it's the new um, kind of hub in, in this hub and spoke model, it used to be, um, you know, getting, yeah, it's just, it, it never used to be as important uh, as it is now. And you think, well, um, is there any other way but to be an authoritative brand? I don't think so. Not in the, uh, not in this brave new world of, of AI. Yeah, for sure. So tell me, tell us where, where we can find you, some of the things that we talked earlier about where there's some opportunities for people to learn more about You've got three books out, you know, just a couple of sentences about that, and then uh, we'll call it a day here. All right. Sounds good. So uh, the book I'm most known for is The Art of SEO, now in its third edition. And uh, I've made Chapter 7 available to your listeners for free. It's uh, going to be at marketingspeak.com slash engine. 
So that's where you get that. Uh, chapter seven is all about link building, content marketing. Since we had a good discussion on that, I think that'll be very pertinent. And then I also included some other things like an SEO hiring blueprint. If you're looking to hire an SEO for your agency, this is a really good process that I go through for screening and onboarding and all that. And then there's the SEO BS detector has some fun uh, uh, quiz questions that you can throw into the interview, see if you got a good candidate there that you're gonna potentially hire. And uh, yeah, so th those are a few fun things that uh, I think will be valuable. I'll also folks should listen to my two podcasts, marketingspeak.com for the Marketing Speak podcast, that's the website, and then getyourselfoptimized.com, which sounds like an SEO podcast, but it's actually biohacking and life hacking. Cool. Uh, personal development, that's a, a passion of mine. Good, good, well thank you Stefan, I really appreciate it, it was an awesome interview and we're excited to get this off to the listeners and thank you again and hopefully, maybe a year from now we'll be talking a whole new thing, maybe there'll be some new thing that will come across Google's mindset to, to implement since the uh, new AI of AI, right? Yes, or, or we'll be speaking to our computers more than we'll be typing on them. Uh, we know that, all right, take care. All right. Thank you.